This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Barry Exball. His work utilizes the latest advances in 3D imaging, stone cutting, and robotic milling to create breathtaking sculptures that are in conversation with art history. The hand-finished sculptures are known for their use of unique varieties of stone from around the world, as well as their meticulous craftsmanship. The results are captivating. And now, a conversation about 21st century stone sculpture with Barry Exball. Barry Exball, thank you so much for joining me today on the Art Sense podcast. Barry, I usually like to start with artists with a hypothetical, which is, say you're seated at a dinner party next to someone who doesn't know you and has never seen your work. How do you describe your work and what it looks like to them? My work is purposely complex, so it would take me a few minutes (laughs) to describe it, but uh, to try to cut that down, um, I'm... Probably the contemporary artist in the international milieu who has most consistently produced stone sculptures, uh, an ancient endeavor uh, for the longest uh, time, uh, for the past uh, over 20 years. Uh, My work is um, recognizable figurative stone sculpture. Beyond that, its relationship to work of the past is uh, uh, <laughs> indirect and uh, and complex. Yeah, I was having a conversation with an artist recently about how a lot of the magic in art making is in unexpected chance. Starting one place and then through working in the studio, through happenstance, through serendipity, the next thing you know, you've you've kind of come upon something that that really resonates. And I thought that might be an interesting conversation to have with you because you haven't always been the the, the Barry X ball we think of today. You're originally from California. You get to New York, and your work looks different when you arrive in New York. Can you kind of describe where you were when you stepped foot at JFK? Well, actually, I drove cross country oh, okay. in a VW bus. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> That's so much more romantic uh, than getting off a plane. Uh, yeah, it turns out that my job, my side job, to support myself as an artist was me delivering parts between JFK, Newark, and LaGuardia Airport. So I did spend a lot of time <laughs> at the airport. Uh, but I uh, spent a month coming across country, uh, visited all the museums, and uh, you know, uh, knew this is where I should be, and uh, had been uh, told that by my professors in college. They knew I was serious and uh, pretty compulsive, dedicated by nature. And at that time, Los Angeles was a far number two to New York in the United States as a place for artists to live and settle. I mean, there's a couple of shows going on right now about LA art in the sixties. And, uh, I, you know, I, there was another reason why I left and it was to get away from uh, a complicated family situation and, uh, never looked back. And so I, I was lucky to have met when I first arrived, uh, the, a group of, artists who were also super serious about what they did, but they were um, coming out of minimalism. uh, And uh, a lot of them were monochrome painters. And uh, the kind of religious fervor that they had for art making uh, matched one thing from my background was that I was raised by intense fundamentalist Christians. I had abandoned that and basically substituted uh, art for Christianity uh, when I met it in college. But I, uh, I met amongst this group of uh, painters uh, in New York a kind of uh, yeah, rules-based practice. Uh, I 
subsequently rejected that too, although uh, I respect what they, they taught me. There was a period in New York when there were not nearly as many galleries. We're talking late 70s, early 80s. The art community was smaller, and almost all of these artists were um, 10 to 30 years older than me, uh, had been in New York for many years and did not have art careers, but painted all the time. And that's a phenomenon we don't really have anymore. You, you know, you come to New York and either you got to get an art career going or you, you, you kind of take off and leave. And these people were going to be here hell or high water and, uh, and make their art. And they spent a huge amount of time doing it and all had side jobs. And that, that was the model that I... <laughs> I drank right. <laughs> in. I, I, I thought I was never going to have an art career either. Concept of selling art, uh, showing in galleries, uh, all of that was kind of foreign. Uh, uh, these people were more about studio practice and then dialogue around it. Uh, I mean, we're talking sitting around the long table with 15 and 20 people recording their dialogues and arguing. Um, civilly but intensely about the aesthetics of what they're doing. I, I just really don't think you have that anymore. And it was a great kind of uh, fundamentalist way for me to, <laughs> uh, you know, again, uh, start thinking about my work. And uh, anyway, so my work reflected that initially, too. You know, one of the guests I had recently uh, on the podcast was Donald Sultan. And in some of your earlier panels, it kind of remind me of work he was doing and work he still does, where he uses plywood to construct these platforms that come two to three inches off the wall. And then he uses a grid of materials to start working on. And, and I see some of that in these uh, original panels. Can you kind of talk about how you went from something that was flat, at the very most considered a relief, to starting to explore three dimensions? Uh, sure. Well, um, I, for the first time, really saw in depth um, historical works here in New York. It, the Metropolitan was my favorite museum. I went there many times more than the uh, modern art museums, uh, the modern, the Guggenheim and the Whitney, uh, and uh, started to fall in love with uh, the directness of Italian gold ground panel paintings, Quattrocento, Trecento, Giotto, Duccio, etc. cetera. And... Um, then started to explore the materials uh, that the artists of that time utilized. I read uh, Cimino d'Andrea Cennini's famous treatise on uh, making paintings, and um, uh, and also read Ralph Mayer's, you know, art technical book that everybody read about working directly, creating your own materials, don't use adulterated commercial materials, etc. And then started to um, think about the support that I painted on. I mean, this is a kind of a confluence of my kind of fascination with this ancient work and the thinking that goes into minimalism, how an object relates to the room it's in, how it's attached to a wall, uh, you know, pedestals, um, revealing everything, uh, stripping away all that is superfluous, etc. One of the monochrome painters, uh, you know, always likened his paintings to racing sailboats. And he said that everybody else was um, making cargo liners, carrying cultural cargo. I'm making stripped down racing vessels mm. okay uh you know i'm i you know have come a long way from that kind of absolutist stance but that was <laughs> the thinking that was uh current at that time really getting uh beyond uh, the modernist initial breakthroughs and getting pretty religious um you know donald judd robert ryman bryce martin were admired artists um 
uh, Richard Serra and so on, uh, for me and, and this, this group of people I was with. And, you know, eventually, even when I moved beyond uh, being involved with this monochrome group, uh, I, you know, I loved that, that approach. And I've often said that if you look at what I'm doing today, if it's a flayed um, riff on St. Bartholomew, uh, it has the same thinking as my works that were monochrome rectangles on a wall. And I think a lot of people confuse minimalist thinking with boxes, spheres, cones, <laughs> circles, reductive forms. And to me, it was more a comprehensive, minute way of thinking about an object and all the elements that go into it and how it's presented. And it could actually take a figurative form, but still have that same rigor of thought. And I think I've kept that. that that's at the core of my art making, even though the form is radically different than what I did and made uh, 30 and 40 years ago here in New York. When you departed uh, this monochrome group, is that when you started experimenting with the black and white cut Corian pieces? Uh, yeah. Um, that was a kind of a, if you want to look back retrospectively, you sound like an art historian. Well, me, I try. I, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's a, a transitional phase. I suppose that's it. I started being, uh, again, just seductively interested in Italian uh, striped Gothic architecture, Siena Cathedral, um, San Mignato al Monte in Florence, uh, the, the, the buildings in Pistoia. I, I just somehow loved that. I related to striped paintings that I was seeing that were you know, more contemporary. And uh, started making the units of my support, the width of the stripes, equal to the size of the squares of gold. I mean, everything had to make mm. logical sense, but they became steadily more complex. This work with the support led me to um, teach myself to be a woodworker. I should say that, you know, I went to a liberal arts college, uh, uh, Pomona College, Claremont, California. It mm -hmm. was the only non-religious uh, school I had applied to. I was having severe doubts about my whole fundamentalist background, and and when it came time to accept admission, it was my only choice. And the rest of them were like Biola and Westmont and mm -hmm. all these other Bible colleges. And you know, thank God I met art and. <laughs> all of the disciplines that I'd been sheltered from uh, growing up. And, uh, you know, uh, look, here, here I am. But uh, in terms of my work, it comes out of Catholicism. You'd have to say all of those gold ground paintings I'm looking at, was looking at, uh, were depictions of religious scenes. But I, I was focusing more on the object. And I, I taught myself to be a woodworker. Um, I picked up all the technical skills that uh, they didn't have time for in a liberal arts college. I, mean, I remember asking a professor, I went with a long list of how do you do this? Where do you find that? How do you buy this? How do you make this? And he says, Barry, we don't have time to talk about that here. We talk about ideas. It was probably a pretty good I, good thing mm -hmm. because they would have taught me ceramics or clay modeling or oil painting. I mean, I did a little bit of all those things, but you know, I ended up having this really uh, high-tech uh, slash old-school working method that they wouldn't have taught me anyway. Uh, and so I, I went about learning how to make things in New York in a very uh, dedicated way. I, I had respect for New York and the artists who were here. I felt like this is the Olympics. And you don't, you know... <laughs> You don't go there unless you've been training for years to be able to make things well. And uh, so that in that process of learning to make things, it, it just amplified my uh, desire to make the support of the painting part of the painting. And then the next step was to have it come off the wall and start to be a sculpture, per se. 
and you know that progression has continued to where now I am a sculptor. How did that transition go from the discipline of these forms to being attracted to the the figure? Was there a particular point? Was there a particular project where you kind of dipped your toe in the water and figured out that that this is this is what's been missing in my life? Uh, yeah, there was there were a couple of things. One is I made these very complex suspended black and white sculptures, uh, complex to make and lay out. And I have to say that at the end of it, I was not surprising myself. I was trying to feel like, man, this is a real mountain to climb to make each one of these. And there was not enough buzz at the end of that process, simply. And I was looking for something else that was actually more difficult, uh, but that would surprise me. And at the same time, I remember I was milling a striped block on the Bridgeport milling machine that I built and uh, and the cutter bit into it and made curved lines. A simple thing. Uh, imagine like a slice out of this kind of looking like a Bridget Riley painting or mm-hmm. some op art thing, a uh, Vazzarelli or something. But they were swirling and, you know, at the midpoint in making this thing. And I'm going curved surface what would be the most complex curved surface to deal with and i thought the human head and you know i had no figurative training uh etc and i just thought you know there's there's a hell of an endeavor uh let's uh <laughs> <laughs> let's think about doing that and you know long process led to me doing uh 50 60 portrait sculptures in stone but uh, something else happened at the same time is the advance in technology. Uh, I was given my first computer by Apple in 1988 under this wow. program they called Apple Seed. Uh, luckily, I barely caught the digital wave. I was 33 at that time, and uh, they gave them the artist just to see what in the hell we do with them. Um, and uh, I was then one of the earliest adopters of 3D scanning uh, at that time, was only available in the military and Hollywood. I, my first uh, figurative sculpture sculpture was actually a self portrait where I went to L.A. special effects area on the valley and got myself 3D scanned through this kind of cumbersome early iteration of that machine, those that that, that equipment, and. Uh, I felt like I could do figurative sculpture in a new analytic way and bypass all that traditional Bernini-esque, Echo de Beaux-Arts, Jerome uh, figure modeling training, making the Ecorche figures and all of that. And then as a result, my work would be different. It wouldn't be traditional figurative stone sculpture uh, by employing uh, all the advances in digital technology. Help me understand, like, so this is in the 90s, you're able to to get a a 3D scan. Do they have the type of uh, robotic milling that you use today back then? Or how are you using that 3D scan? Because I feel like, you know, at some point, technologies converged around you. Through a revolution there, uh, including 3D printing now, which is a big part of the uh, at least... uh, midpoint of making my work. Uh, yeah, um, there were kind of crude 3D mills, CNC, computer numerically controlled mills available. Um, they were kind of adaptations originally of non-CNC uh, milling machines that had been used for a long time. There was also uh, duplicating machines um, kind of uh imagine when you have a key made how they Mm, drag mm -hmm. a little pointer across the little teeth of your key and it mills another one next to you imagine that in 3d space that's the kind of tools that are available i i I made one a 3d duplicator machine wow and it was just like progressively we get to the point now where i'm using anthropomorphic robots like the ones you see in car factories uh and uh the the scanning now um 
you used to have to sit in a chair and hold a pose for 18 seconds while the scanner swung around you. It was kind of like the old daguerreotypes. Uh, you know, the, it yielded these kind of frozen <laughs> poses. <laughs> and uh, now you can have a portrait sculpture victim sit in an array of 240 high-end 3D, uh, I mean, digital SLRs and have those 240 cameras fire simultaneously, like you're having your portrait taken, I can be talking to the person, we can snap multiple shots and get this, these beautiful 3D images uh, with no pain to the, to the portrait sculpture victim, um, great resolution. Uh, I mean, I used to, for all my early portrait sculptures, had to life cast everybody, which was hard on the sitters, you know, your face covered with alginate and plaster. And, you know, uh, I did that. And then I would make a plaster positive and scan it uh, because the scanning technology really wasn't so good for scanning a live human. Now that's easy. Now the scanners that we I scan historical sculptures with are handheld super fast i'm i you know uh i just was in florence italy up on scaffold scanning uh donatello's judas and holofernes oh wow uh and uh we could do the whole thing in three hours but boom done uh even as far back as 2011 i scanned um saint bartholomew flayed in the duomo of milano and michelangelo's pieta rondonini and that would take like three days per sculpture with painstakingly taking a series of 3D scans and then having the software piece them together. Now you have this handheld thing. You just kind of wipe figuratively over the surface of the sculpture. You don't touch it, but you just kind of almost color it in. And there it is as a 3D object. Uh, so, you know, it's made everything easier and cheaper. I mean, the original scanners, the, the really good ones were a couple hundred thousand bucks. Now for this state of the art thing, it's $30,000 for same thing with 3D printers. Everything has gotten more accessible. Uh, although I would have to say for young artists, I, whenever I see anybody working in stone, and I really don't know the world of traditional stone sculpting. I, again, I never was trained that way. I've never wielded a hammer and chisel in my life. I mean, I'm a very good maker of things. Again, I taught myself to be a cabinet maker and uh, work with all kinds of materials and have uh, a beautiful shop, but I never did that traditional Michelangelo-esque stone sculpting. And whenever I see somebody hacking away at a block of stone, I go, why? And the number one reason why uh, for young artists is it's super pricey to use uh, robots. I mean, uh, you know, six figure bills and, and they can't do it. So they're, they're basically undervaluing their own labor and just hacking away on, on blocks of stone for no reason. But, you know, except that, you know they can't afford to do it another way. That brings up a question I've always had about sculptors in the world of art, and that is economic complexities of being a large-scale sculptor. You you almost have to have a customer ahead of time because building a large-scale sculpture on spec, someone's taking on a great deal of risk, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and so can you tell me kind of how you have navigated that over the years? Uh, well, because I worked... Uh relatively small human head size when I was doing uh, figurative work and in my work before that normal kind of painting costs, not so crazy on the material side. Uh, even when I got into stone, uh, you know, I was working small. And so I purposely did all my portraits on spec. I wanted to have the freedom to do what I wanted to do. I, I wasn't meeting a client's expectations. And, I, you know, luckily was able to show these things as independent uh, portrait heads, the same way we would go to the Capitol and museums in Rome and look, you know, anonymous Roman types as well as emperors and so on. And I, uh, you know, I like that, but you're right. Once you start getting into larger works and uh, you know, that felt like something I really wanted to do, uh, commissions are really helpful, although I'm crazy enough that I, I have a couple pieces downstairs in the big studio fabrication hall right now, which are close to seven figures to fabrication bills that I have 
risk myself. Uh, you know, it's uh, I'm you know maybe addicted to risk. Uh, you know, I'm <laughs> I don't play cards. Being <laughs> raised a fundamentalist Christian, I don't gamble. I don't. I, I walk away from games. I think it's because my whole life as an artist has been one big risk. <laughs> I don't want to play at games on the side. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's a it's a huge issue. Um, I, I I did a portrait of Prince Albert of Monaco and I'm now actually I was commissioned to do his wife Princess Charlene and those are realized in solid gold um, uh, like uh, I think the princess uh, has uh, 26 pounds of gold in that case yeah I had to have a commission to work with that crazy you know amount of money uh, uh, just on material alone uh, to make it so that that's been fun. I would have never gotten to do that, uh, to work in solid gold without the commission. It makes me curious because, I mean, gold is incredibly dense, and I'm just trying to think, does this wind up being the size of a softball, or is it hollow in terms of like your your Pope John Paul II in terms of uh, the, the honeycomb of that construction? How how big are these portraits? They're, they're life-size, like a human head. Oh. Um the the conceptual idea was that um, I wanted to work from the core out. With stone, you're working on the surface. It's been an issue that I've been thinking about more and more. Is there's always a mass at the core of stone sculpture, partly because of the delicacy of the material. Have you ever had anything stretching out, like an arm or a foot or something? They would always incorporate a prop into uh, the stone. I mean, Michelangelo's David has a tree growing up its back of its leg. You'd have Roman equestrian sculptures with a tree in the belly of the horse. Uh, the guy would be gesturing out and you'd have kind of a spear or another prop coming out of his body. You know, it's a difficult material to make an airy, arabesque-like form with, uh, technically. And I, I've been doing that actually with stone too, but I, I, I thought if, when I'm working with metal, I can, I can do that. I'm working additively, first of all. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not hacking away at a mass to get down to the figure. I mean, the classic division of sculpture is, uh, you know, Rodin being the model of the additive built up forms versus Michelangelo hacking away and getting down to the form. I mean, these portraits I did of the um, prince and princess uh, were the first ones that I did additively. So they were 3D printed in wax, the mm -hmm. elements. And uh, yeah, it's not, if it was solid gold at the size of a you know a human head, it would be, you know, crazy heavy. Uh, but I wanted you to be able to see all the way through to the core. There are um, symbolic elements in there, the shield of Monaco and the knights, and the element that suffuses the whole head is seaweed uh, because of uh, Prince Albert's support of ocean conservation and study. Uh, his family uh, supported Jacques Cousteau, etc. And so, you know, he's a, a prince, a blingy guy, but he has a very good uh, environmental record, which I'm all over. My family are all a bunch of environmentalists, including me. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I had an opportunity to kind of bring a lot of things together there. But uh, uh, in that case, I I work with the Italian jewelry company Damiani uh, on, on the, those portraits. I do a lot of the work. We do all the digital sculpting here at my studio, and then I'm back and forth a lot to Italy. Um, I'm in Italy five to six times a year working on various aspects of all of my my artwork. Uh, did I understand right that you have your main studio in Brooklyn, but there's another studio that works on larger pieces in Italy? Did I understand that right? Well, I have uh, I work with outside fabricators. Um, I see. And so, you know, I have one work here, I think has 10 different outside fabricators on it. And we kind of act like, the, the clearinghouse, the the control of all of that. And we never have a piece fabricated uh, by anybody and it's delivered to the gallery and here's my finished artwork. Uh, you know, we're, first of all, on all stonework, we do all the handwork here. Uh, 
the next part of what I'm going to say is I'm meaning no, to cast no aspersions on the work of my contemporaries, uh, several of whom are my friends and whose work I respect. But uh, it's probably not so well known that uh, there is one room in Carrara, Italy, a large fabrication room, where you can see the stoneworks of most of the international level contemporary sculptors simultaneously being made. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these are really good artists. I mean, we're from Tony Craig to Jan Fabra, from Damien Hirst to Jeff Koons to Vanessa B. Croft uh, to Mark Quinn, da, da, Adele Emeseba, da, 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 you literally right. have them lined up. And there'll be these teams of Italian craftspeople working on them, and they could have robot milling as part of it. Uh, I still uh, utilize the robot milling uh, capability of my friends there in, in Carrara, Italy. I also have another facility I work with in the U.S. Uh, but that's the one element of the whole long, complex, winding path to making one of my works that is done off-site. They don't touch my work. I'm known as the crazy American guy who won't let the, <laughs> the famous Italian crafts people touch his work. Uh, we, uh, you know, I have a team here, and, and it's it's also different in terms of uh, number of hours. On a, a large, let's say, human scale monumental piece, I spend up to ten thousand hours of handwork after all of the advanced processes played out. Um, uh, they, they showed me proudly one of the works in Carrara, and I won't say who is by, uh, and they said, we spent 500 hours on this. That's kind of their limit uh, when you get a, a sculpture made, just for budgetary reasons and so on. I mean, this is also the problem uh, for me and my bankroll is that I, I'm not willing to call it quits at any one point for budgetary reasons. We just keep going. But uh, that's probably what you saw is that the robot milling is done off-site. We are in the process of getting our first uh, robot here at the studio. Um, I still hope I'm gonna be working with my uh, my friends and collaborators in Italy and here in the States. Uh, but, but I built this entire new studio complex over 10 years. Uh, it's 20,000 square feet with all of the infrastructure in place to have every aspect of the making of my work all in one facility. And uh, the only thing we're missing right now is a robot. We have a, a giant custom-made Pellegrini computer-controlled diamond wire saw. We have water filtration system, uh, twin 20-ton bridge cranes, uh, you know, industrial air compressors, all of the stuff you need to back up all of the, you know, kind of high-tech processes. And uh, we're just missing that one one element at the moment that's going to be here. Uh, that robot's on its way? Uh, yeah, we're, we're in the process of specking it out uh, to get it over here. I mean, they're, they're kind of custom made and it's, uh, you know, yeah, it'll be here probably within the next year. Sure. Uh, and, and when we work with robots offsite, uh, we also are very involved in laying out the tool paths, programming, working side by side with the people who have them. I think my work is the only uh, stone sculpture that has evidence of the robot milling and part of the final product. Uh, a pattern of flutes, ridges that I vary and specify. Sometimes it looks like corduroy cloth, for example, mm -hmm. in the bed of the sleeping hermaphrodite. Or to me, it uh, kind of recalls uh, this pattern of fluting on Egyptian sculptures uh, in the right. drapery, et cetera. I want evidence of the process and I cultivate that. And we're you know, like writing that tool path and transmitting it to the people with the machine. So, I mean, the next step is to have the machine. I, I'm not just showing up with a sure. model, which is a, and saying, hey, get this thing made and then show up and see the finished product. We're, we're pretty down in the trenches with all aspects. Uh, I mean, there's a tradition there also. I mean, the, the college I went had this uh, amazing Rodan and that the backside of it was rough hewn. You could see, uh -huh. you could still see evidence of these, uh, back in the day, there would be the maquette and they would take measurements uh -huh. around the maquette and drill into specific depths and then hack away. Yep. 
which, you know, again, is it's all part of this automated process that you're taking advantage of today. It's just if they had the opportunity to do it uh, 120 years ago, they certainly would have. Uh, Michelangelo was he actually developed this water and bath immersion technique for measuring and scaling up. Uh, that is very close to digital technology. The, the the levels of the water are very close to like CAT scan slices through a figure. I mean, these guys would have been all over it. The idea that there's some romantic vision they had of chipping stone by the fireside, that's just some later conceit. They, they were pushing the envelope <laughs> for their time. Uh, Canova, who developed the pointing up technique, which you're, you're describing, I mean, there's still people doing it. When I go to Italy, I see them moving the frame back and forth with the points and the marks on the plaster model and everything. I'm going, why? Because it's basically halfway to the robot work. And there's nothing fun about it. You're not really utilizing your sculpture skills that much. You're just removing material for months. It's drudge work. Uh, You don't let the machine do that for you. Uh, And then, you know, then you can sculpt. Uh, the final surface of mine is sculpted. I mean, I, the, my team is all people with master's degrees uh, in, in sculpture, some of them from traditional academies that teach in the old way. And I utilize that fantastic knowledge base in the making of my work. I mean, uh, you know, it's not like we press print and the robot makes the work and we walk away. No, it's, uh, it's just a tool in the process of making it the final work. But, you know, it it seems like even though their hands are on the objects, it seems like as as a sculptor than the names you were throwing out earlier, you are probably more integrally involved in the process than most of your peers. Having that fabrication in your studio, what do you think? Yeah, it's... uh... If there was one raison d'etre for building this whole studio, for having this studio in its current form, was to have the material and what I'm doing with it, the forms I want to make, the the ideas I want to pursue, interlaced. Uh, There's a lot of utilization of white marble to this day, or gray, you know, maybe black granite, when you see a contemporary sculpture, you know, or... I hate bronze, but, you know, it's in the black patinaed green or whatever, patinaed bronze, kind of dead materials that are a bit inert. I mean, Carrara marble is a beautiful stuff, justifiably famous. The entire Italian stone industry started because the Romans found it there and it's been used for millennia and it's a gorgeous fine grain material. But the crazy thing is the first time I went to Carrara, uh, I saw 30 miles of stacked blocks in a rainbow of colors and different translucencies, veined, pitted, fissured, incredible material stuff, uh, stacked from all over the world. Uh, It's the stone shopping center of the world, Iranian translucent pink, a Brazilian uh, blue, uh, you know, Bolivian stone, uh, Vietnamese white, Egyptian, Portuguese, uh, Southern French. I mean, it's that the people haven't really used that to great expressive uh, effect. It was kind of shocking to me. I'm going, how, how can you drive by all this stuff and head for the white every time? <laughs> you know. Sure. And I, I remember I'm walking to the Uffizi and I'm looking down that long hallway that we all look at before we charge in and see the, you know, the Giotto and the Duccio and the Cimabue and start our tour and end up with the Botticelli's. There's this endless Vasari hallway down there with white twisting forms. And I didn't want to add one more to that pile. I, I just felt like you can come on. Let's let's utilize uh, the <laughs> incredible possibilities inherent in what the Earth produces. And it, it you know it brings me to a more basic question. Sorry if I'm rambling on no. here about. I, I I'm not a reflexive stone sculpture maker. Again, coming out of minimalism, examining everything. I mean, I want to understand why I'm utilizing this material. It's not just like in the tradition as a way to make a permanent 
work of art and oh gee isn't it a miracle that you could carve that thing out of a stone which i get all the time you know i mean we all go to see david in the academia in florence and we go he made it out of a rock oh my god he could never make a mistake and what if he you know that i mean the whole mysticization of stone is part of what you know still is there even with advanced crazy forms of a contemporary artist I just felt like there was this whole other world I could bring to it. They talk about the translucency of Canara marble. My God, it's not not even translucent at all compared to the onyxes in the world, which to me can dematerialize this very stony stuff, uh, this obdurate material, and and make it diaphanous and uh, ethereal. And I've I've played with that and. Uh, I'm using a lot of these crazy veined, uh, you know, a lot of Mexican onyx that I get from, not from Italy, from the desert to Baja, California. Uh, it, it looks wounded. It looks bloody. looks like it's been attacked. Uh, and then, you know, play up that with what I'm, I'm making out of the sculpture. So, yeah, it's, a, it's a, an all-encompassing <laughs> material plus form adventure I'm on. So what I'm hearing is that you you make very conscious decisions about matching stones to perhaps the the emotion or what you're trying to communicate with a piece. For example, Bartholomew in the the Rouge de Roi marble seems like a perfect complement, right? Or the Iranian translucent onyx with with purity, the ability to actually have that translucence. I've heard you say that the Mexican onyx is your favorite. What about it excites you the most? Uh, first of all, I should say that I am super impressed that you have done your research and know all these pieces <laughs> and the stones I've used for them. I, this is not normal, and I'm honored that you, you did this. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. The St. Bartholomew, I wanted to look like U.S. DA prime beefsteak, well marbled, uh, meaty and bloody. Uh, uh, yeah, and the translucent for a translucent veil. Yes, um, the Mexican onyx is a bit of a a crapshoot. Uh, I mean, we we now scan all the blocks that we utilize and are able to move the figure around inside of it and position it to the best of our ability with what's going on with uh, veins and. Uh, features of the stone, but there's still a random kind of acceptance that you have to have. I mean, you're going to utilize that stone. You're going to, you have to be prepared to accept what it gives you. And uh, I, you know, I've, I think a good example is I did Mexican onyx scholars rocks out of that, the Chinese tradition, mm -hmm. which is basically I view as a, almost a precursor of Duchamp, who was, by the way, my favorite artist in college. I loved the radicality of everything about it, the conceptual strangeness. I mean, to me, I mean, I never went to a museum as a kid. You know, you got this guy who's, you know, been to the museum and out the other side doing crazy stuff. But, you know, a ready-made is about decontextualizing and recontextualizing, you know, you put a bottle rack or a urinal or a snow shovel in the new context. You don't do anything to it. You present it, you maybe change how it lays or something. Mm -hmm. And that's it. It's, you know, art is in the head, not the hand. And uh, the Chinese had actually been doing that for thousands of years by in a pure act of connoisseurship, grabbing a rock out of nature and just presenting it on a wooden stand, almost like God's a better sculptor than we could ever be. And sure, <laughs> but the, 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 so I started that, that to me fit exactly like what I was saying earlier there. These guys are kind of thinking about uh, utilizing natural forms at a basic level. And I'm utilizing these very assertive stones, which, are not neutral carriers of form and content. They add something to it. And I've got to have kind of a reason why I'm doing it. So to me, they were, Scholar's Rocks were like natural ready-mates. And, and the strange thing was that then the Chinese, if there was a good one, then they started copying them, 
or they started, they almost had like an Olympic scoring system. This one's got a nine for perforation and this one's got, a, you know, an eight for color. Right. And they would become renowned scholars rocks that would become archetypes that other people would, would copy or they'd, they'd kind of modify it. If there were some imperfect parts of the natural stone. And, and, and to me, I mean, all that stuff is, is, is interesting. It's, it's just part of recognizing what you're utilizing, not just accepting it as a carrier of information. Uh, I think I said that's why I don't like bronze. It's inert to me. It doesn't bring much to it besides the tradition of bronze. And, you know, I've done a couple of sculptures out of white marble, and I have to say that they've been fun, and I like the results, but they don't seem like my work. They seem a little cold and inert. And, and if all my works, I'm trying to get multiple levels simultaneously hitting you. If it's a portrait sculpture, the features of the sitter, then there's the color of the stone. Then there's what I do with the robot on top of that. And then I would put sometimes Victorian floral relief over the top of that. Uh, and then there's the veination of the stone. I'm trying to like make it so suffused with information that it's suffocatingly dense that you, you can't tell, uh, people tell me sometimes my work look like they're like a hologram because mm -hmm. there, there's almost too much to take in at once. And to me, that's the essence of a real object in the real world that can't be reproduced. That's kind of what I'm, I'm aiming for is something that requires direct experience and, and, and not a simple one time get. I mean, we all love pop, art and punk rock and it's all about mm -hmm. super direct and is what it is i i tend to really like layered conceptually um uh, iconographically uh, you know technique wise works from the past this richness that you know is a hard one and that you know hits you on many levels and many different days in different ways uh, to me that's the definition of a great work of art is that incredible complexity that i'm shooting for i hope and maybe achieve every once in a while so yeah you know it's funny you you, t you speak of the scholar stones and if you had asked me two or three years ago what a scholar stone was i would have drawn a total blank but there was this incredibly popular movie from korea just uh, a year and a half ago uh, parasite and the whole yeah. plot of the movie kind of pivots on the scholar stone it, they kind of have to explain to you what it is, you know, as part of the plot. And so let me ask well, you. Yeah. Artists love them, too. <laughs> yeah, so. Sure. Well, I mean, it seems, you know, kind of tied to the like the whole concept of like a bonsai tree, right? Maybe there's a little yep. bit more manual manipulation in creating a bonsai. But it's this same thought of having this imaginary, unexpected juxtaposition of scale, right? Your work is obviously paying homage to historic masterpieces. Can you talk to, you know, kind of the history of artists being in dialogue with the artwork that comes before them and how you're continuing that long history of being in dialogue? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, I remember in Jansen's art history, they almost um, started big... Uh, chapters, big sections of the book with, um, I think it was like Mantegna's take on Durer and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Picasso's take on earlier artists. I mean, that's a classic student exercise just to copy from the masters. I mean, you go to the Metropolitan Museum today, you got people with easels painting, uh, you know, so uh, it's one more instance where the, uh, advances in technology gave me the ability to, I thought, uh, get just the facts from the big, from the get go. When one artist is doing his take on another, there's interpretation, uh, in the traditional way of doing it. I mean, there's a, they show, uh, Michelangelo's earliest work. It's, I, it's in, um, come on, it's in Fort Worth, uh, at the, um, come on, the Lewis Kahn building. Yeah. Uh, at the, at the, the Kimball. At the Kimball. Yeah, it came to New York. It's a, it's after Martin Schoengauer, mm -hmm. The Temptation of St. Anthony and the young Michelangelo, I think when he was like 13, 
I did this take on it, but it was colored. It wasn't an itching. And it was, you know, he's already trying to assert himself and the changes were subtle, but significant. And, uh, to me, I mean, one goal has been to keep all the power of the historical works I'm working with, but take them to a new place. And I don't like jokes. Can I say that I, when I say a Saturday Night Live episode from my college days, when I thought those things were so hilarious, they fall flat. <laughs> Humor doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work so well anymore. They all look like they're overacting and, you know, Steve right. Martin or Dan Eckwood. And I'm going, yeah, that's, boy, that, that was funny. I, I can't believe that. But, uh, you know, artist gestures that are one-line humorous things. I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but if you put yourself in the lap of uh, – the Virgin and make a Pieta, or if you put high heels on a Bocconi and so on, you know, I'm going, ha ha, that's, a, that's like not, again, that complexity I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for l- introducing lots of subtle changes to, and this is controversial with art historians I've talked to, perfect them. And uh, here's news for you, art historians. The Romans were not that great. They made a lot of errors. Donatello, I'm working with him right now. Oh, my God. Uh, formally and you know, figuratively, they don't even make sense. Uh, <laughs> legs kind of stop and then <laughs> exit at another point. And, uh, I mean, the Romans didn't carve the backside of the sleeping hermaphrodite's face, and so I'm doing that. I'm, I'm trying to kind of take them to a place that those artists who did a fantastic job, especially given the technology that they had to work with in their time, I'm trying to take it to a place they would have gone in their dreams almost. I mean, the Bocconi that I work with, the uh, you know, unique forms of continuity in space, Bocconi never had money to make a bronze in his lifetime. That one at MoMA is 20-something years posthumous. The one at the Met's a horror show made by the family of Marinetti, the, the you know, the, <laughs> the rabble-rouser of futurism, uh, bad fabrication. I mean, to me, that that's an interesting thing. There's no real original because... <laughs> He never had time to make one, and I'm I'm thinking the whole time of Bocconi, who was an amazing sculptor, would be considered the equal of Picasso and all the early 20th century sculptors. If he had been able to realize his work in permanent materials, they all got lost and washed away. He got dragged to death by a horse in World War One, and they were kind of lost, and we only had a couple plasters. And so there's that weird exhumation thing that I'm doing. But I'm also picking subjects I think they're a little less familiar. I didn't work with Michelangelo's Pietà in Rome. I worked with strange historical subjects that maybe are less well-known. It gives me a little bit of room to run to get away from the stereotypes that accompany the more well-known ones. So, Do you think you'll ever feel inclined to do something far more contemporary? So, For example, I came across a video of you online visiting the Ferrari headquarters in Italy. Would you contemplate creating a Dino out of Rouge de Bois? Well, not, not that one, but... Uh... Yeah, Flavio Manzoni, the design director there, it turned out liked my work and he invited me to come down. And it's this weird thing that uh, my, uh, you know, I didn't have many opportunities to be inspired visually as a kid, but we always took our vacations in Palm Springs at the off season rates in the middle of August uh, for like three days at a motel. It's like 120 degrees. And, uh, you know, but the, Modernist architecture there, and, and my first experience with uh, an it- Italian car was there in the 60s when I was like 12, and uh, it changed my life. Uh, my assistants were saying after that that visit, a couple went with me to, to the Ferrari factory. It's like, got the same stuff you were saying there as what you say at the studio. I mean, don't let the line stop moving. And, you know, da, 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 there's a flat spot on it. And I, I you know, I, I'd like to imbibe that from Ferrari. So the fact that my work has of late had ancient historical sources is no indi- indication of where my work is going. Uh, it, uh, I started working with the Madardo Rosso project uh, because uh, the forms are on the verge of complete abstraction. Uh, the, I see that strain and the scholars' rocks coming together. And we have a big new development that we've been experimenting with for a long time now of blending multiple species of stone where I'll be painting with them. And I effectively painting with 
various colors and translucencies that's going to lead in a whole new way that may not even involve a scan at the at the at the base uh so uh you know it's uh I, I keep saying I'm not one of those guys dressing up in the Civil War costume out, to, you know, historically reenacting. I'm, right. you know, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I hope I'm in the middle of a critical critical enterprise here, and uh, don't mistake the ancient forms for some antiquarian endeavor. I, I don't know if you like people quoting your, your words back to you, Barry. But uh, uh, well, I, I don't know if I do. <laughs> okay, depends on what you're going to quote. Well, okay. you know, it's it's from an artist talk, and and I, I thought it 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 kind of gets to a, a nugget of maybe who you are, and uh, I'm just going to read it here. It says, "I had okay. a I had a religious upbringing, a lot of right and wrong being true. This calling to be an artist wasn't about making presentations, making theater." It was about doing something really real and pursuing it to the maximum and inspiring people to work with me in that same way. And when I hear that, it sounds like at the core of your process and who you are, are things like integrity and leadership, a commitment to excellence. And you, you really sound like a coach. What do you think? I, uh, well, it is important about uh, to me. I, I can't do anything I do now without this incredible team. So I'm always wondering what inspires these people. I mean, uh, probably most of them would like to be me or, you know, an artist having shows, supporting himself off his art. And I always say, you know, short of that, I want it to be the best job you could have in the art world so you know i built the new studio with a lot of thought to the the beauty of the spaces the creature comforts and when we have barbecues we've got uh, locker rooms with showers we've got uh, health plans we've got retirement plans i mean i'm trying to take care of these incredible people who work with me but also inspire them because uh Again, on their budgets, they could never work with the materials and the processes that we're, you know, we're utilizing. Uh, they um, have never done something that took a thousand or hours, let alone ten thousand hours, to make. And I'm always saying, you know, the look at the in the end, I, I've got my name on it. That's how the art world works. We all know that this is a team effort here, uh, and it's embarrassing. For me to have people walk through my studio and say I all the time. In fact, dealers have corrected me. Stop saying we. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they want to market the great genius <laughs> thing. And I'm, uh, you know, so I'm always thinking what motivates these people. And I'm, I mean, I have really high goals for for art. I I think of the Gothic cathedrals. I think of Ghiberti's Gates of Paradise. I think of incredible superhuman efforts that yield these drop your drawers, unbelievable achievements. Uh, and I, I kind of feel like I don't find that so much in the contemporary art world. Uh, you know, and I'm, uh, I'm really interested in that. I mean, my, I played classical piano. My kids played with a very intense Russian teacher. I remember she didn't know me and my work, but she said to me, uh, you know about my kids she goes you give me 10 years and they can begin to have a creative thought <laughs> and y- y- you know and i'm going okay and, and it's funny i'm going and you're talking to me about that <laughs> i'm the guy who spent 10 years teaching myself how to make things and uh, uh you know like a i'm not worthy <laughs> i felt like saying when i got to new york i need to be worthy to compete with is the greatest things ever made. I mean, that's that's a goal. I try to uh, uh, pass that on to people here. I have a well-known contemporary art supporter. He's a really good guy. And he sent me a, a contemporary relief, which I thought was kind of insipid and, uh, you know, by a super well-known artist. And I, he goes, Barry, what do you think of this? And I sent him back an image of uh, Guberti's Gates of Paradise. And he said to me, well, that's not fair. And I said, oh, it, the hell it isn't. 
I mean, isn't that supposed to be the goal? To 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 do better than that, to at least be that good with a contemporary intent and content. I, I mean, to me that that's that's what this is about, and I'll die trying. But I, you know, I've got to. I've got to inspire this group of people to work with me to to go for it, and they work in a way I know different than they do on their own work. I I've told them all I I never want to visit your apartment. I'm sure half of you you know live with a messy place, you know? <laughs> but you all you all stuck it up when you come here and work my way, and the tools are all lined up. Tom Sachs calls it knowing, you know they're all you know that's just to me satisfying as as a whole picture of how you live your life and and what you do uh you know and so um i hope that they take good things away from it not just my my team and think i'm just a nut i you know i i, I think it's effective but yeah it is it is in my my thoughts all the time about why do they kill themselves to make what they do do what they do for me and i think i say look it's because of what we're making is going to live beyond us and it's we want to contribute to the culture the same way I have been powerfully affected by 500-year-old, 1,000-year-old, 2,000-year-old objects that were made with intense intensity and passion. Uh, you know, we're trying to add to that. We're trying to, you know, that's how the U.S. will be defined. We won't know Donald Trump. We won't know Joe Biden. We won't know much about all the particulars. I mean, those who know the Ghibellines and the Guelphs and all the details of Florentine society of the 15th and 16th century, they're specialists. I, I tend to know it because I'm nutty about that era. But I mean, does it matter? It, what matters is that things came together and some people produced for a period of 100, 150 years there in Florence, some extraordinary leaps of human intellect and and, and and ability that have inspired everybody since the time. And I, you know, I kind of feel like that should be the goal today still, uh, you know, so and, anyway, no, there your, we go. your, your passion is obvious, Barry. Um, so you, you have a show up right now at Magnoni gallery in, uh, in uh -huh. New York, uh, Cy Twombly, Barry X ball, a history of painting and sculpture, what will people see there if uh, if they swing by in uh, in the next couple of months? Um, well, you're, it's uh, a small gallery. Fernando is well known for showing minimalist artists. He's related in by fa his family. He has Elvira Gonzalez Gallery in Madrid. He's from Madrid. Um, uh, well known for minimalist masters uh, and always beautiful booths. Uh, at the fairs and uh, you know I, I like him as a guy a lot and he and my dealer uh, out of Milano Paul McCabe uh, who's been all over I did shows with him in Stockholm and he's South African and he <laughs> spent a lot of time in London and New York they they kind of actually independently came up with this idea which to me made perfect sense it's two American guys who me and Sly Twombly who may be the most influenced by uh, the work of Italy. I mean, Twombly spent 50 years there. He basically escaped from New York and spent the rest of his life kind of almost in solitude in, in, in Italy. And I'm going there multiple times for my material, my uh, scanning historical sculptures for the many shows I've had there. I have a lot of collectors and now fabricators, multiple fabricators uh, in Italy I've connected with on metal, machine parts, furniture components, stone, etc. It's uh, an incredibly rich country. Uh, I mean, you know, it's not a new assessment there. And it's just about uh, how to guys who spent their life responding to that country and the art it produced, uh, you know, kind of got to two different places, but there's a lot of linking elements uh, in the show. Uh, so my works in the main gallery are from my Medardo Rosso project, you know, inspired by the work of the late 19th, early 20th century artist. And Twombly's are all on the wall. Uh, and we borrowed some really seminal works of his uh, from the early 50s when he was in New York. And, uh, you know, it's a bit poetic, the link, 
it's not one-to-one -one correspondences, but um, uh, you, you have to see it is all I can say. It's, uh, you know, it's an honor to be showing with his, his work. He was a great artist. And Barry, if, if folks wanted to keep track of you and your work and uh, what the latest is, uh, is there your website? Is that the best place for, for people to, to keep track of your practice? There's a lot of things uh, going on right now. The website, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a pretty good overview. Uh, there's actually, I have a social media guy. There's an Instagram feed that we, we post every day on what's going on at the studio. We had a 90-person Passover Seder here uh, on Friday night. Wow. And, you know, 50 people cooking and serving and truckloads of material coming in. It was, it was a lot of fun with a, a, a well-known collector, a friend of mine. And uh, that kind of stuff is, is visible. Uh, we are talking to several people on the NFT front. That's going to be coming up. Uh, and then there's um, a, a variety of exhibitions uh, in, the, in the cards. Um, there's um, uh, next big one would be in Florence at several of the historical sites. Uh, the Donatello's I was talking about scanning. I will be exhibiting uh, in Florence at places like the Baptistry and uh, Palazzo Medici, the Palazzo Vecchio, etc. Um, and then you know I had a show in Baku, a big one in the Zaha Hadid uh, designed uh, Haydar Aliyev Cultural Center there. Um, Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, we don't know. With the war and how I feel about it, et cetera, that's a bit on hold. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of large commissions coming up that are fantastic. Uh, I mean, there, there's kind of a lot going on out there. So, that's uh, you know, I guess it gets publicized too. So, Well, it's, it sounds like you're, you, you stay busy, Barry. And even more reason for me to thank you for giving up an hour of your day to, uh, to have a conversation with me. I, I really appreciate your generosity. And it's, it's been quite a pleasure talking to you about uh, your journey and your work. And uh, I can't wait to see more. Well, thank you. And, and again, I, I really appreciate you doing your homework. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. <laughs>